Well, this morning, are you thankful to live in America? I haven't traveled a lot, but I've traveled in a few countries around the world, and believe me, it's always great to come back home. It's, um, we might have our problems and our issues, but I believe it's still the best place on this earth to be. Thank God for that. Well, as we think about uh, Memorial Day and what it, what it stands for, I did a little research, and uh, I, bet, I bet this is a story that most of you probably don't know, where Memorial Day started. Back, back, it was back during the Civil War, or before the Civil War, there was a plantation owner named John Gibbs in Charleston, South Carolina. His plantation had many slaves. Well, before the Civil War, in 1839, or 1835, part of Gibbs' plantation was acquired by the South Carolina Jockey Club. That group developed what was known as the Washington Race Course on that site. It was a place where they had an annual horse race every February, and it was a, it was a track very similar to, to horse races today, an oval track, and they even had a big grandstand built on the site. And... Uh, much like you see grandstands today around racetracks. And they would come together and they would have have horse races. Well, during the Civil War, that racetrack was used as a prisoner of war camp. And when Union soldiers were captured, they were taken to that racetrack. And since that racetrack had a fenced enclosure around the track, they would put them in in this camp. And these soldiers... Men were locked inside that fence, and at least 257 soldiers died while in that camp from disease and exposure and so forth. They were taken out, and they were hastily buried in a mass grave behind the racetrack. After the war, 28 black workmen who'd been freed from slavery went to the site. They dug up those graves and reburied those soldiers They built a fence around it, whitewashed the fence, built an archway over the entrance, and they inscribed the words on that archway, Martyrs of the Race Course. On May 1st of 1865, almost 10,000 people gathered at that race course. Most of them were former slaves who had been freed because of the war. They came together to commemorate those who had given their lives so that they could go free. That was the first Memorial Day celebration in 1865. Today that site is called Hampton Park, and you can still go there today. If you take your notes, I want you to write this down, first of all. Freedom is never free. Freedom is never free. You know, in this country we enjoy a lot of freedom, but it has come at a high price. In the Revolutionary War, 25,000 men died to gain our freedom from the tyranny of England. In the Civil War, 625,000 soldiers died in the Civil War. That is more than in all of World War I and World War II combined. The Civil War brought freedom to millions of slaves. Even though the Declaration of Independence, which states that all men are created equal, it had been signed many years before, it wasn't until after the Civil War that America really started living up to that standard. Did you know the Bible says that you were a slave? Galatians 4.8 says, Formerly, When you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God's. The Bible calls you a slave. I want to look at that this morning about who are you a slave to this morning? Who are you a slave to? You know, we're all born with a sinful nature that enslaves us to sin. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to start there this morning. Galatians chapter 3 and going into chapter 4. And uh, look at what God has to say in his word about slavery today. Chapter 3, verse 26. We're going to start there. It says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All of you belong to Christ 
then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns a whole estate. He is subject to the guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are obeying special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Okay. You know, in order for our enslavement to be taken away, there was a battle that had to be waged. Just like there was the battle of the Civil War back many years ago to get rid of slavery. There was also a battle that had to be won to get rid of our slavery. And that war was between Jesus Christ and Satan. But there were some similarities between the Civil War, the bloodiest war in our history, and God's war, Jesus' war with Satan. If you write this down, my second point, freedom only comes with the shedding of blood. It only comes with the shedding of blood. You know, throughout history, many battles have been fought to liberate oppressed people. We think about World War II when the Nazis had the Jews locked up in concentration camps where they were dying from starvation and disease and just simply being murdered. It was the Americans and the Allied forces who finally came and defeated the Germans and set the captives free, but they shed a lot of blood in the process. We think about the Korean War. 26,000 Americans lost their lives so that South Koreans could be free. Today, the South Koreans enjoy freedom and prosperity while their neighbors to the north are still under communist rule and the oppression of the tyranny of communism. In the spiritual war that has been raging from the beginning of time, God looked down and he saw people in distress. He saw people enslaved to Satan, enslaved to sin, oppressed by the enemy. So he sent his son into the battle. His son, his only son, he sent to rescue an oppressed world. It's only through his son that we can move free. Like Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Look at verses 4 and 5 there in chapter 4. It says, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights as sons. You know, under the old law, there was a lot of shedding of blood, wasn't it? We've been reading through that as we've, as we've read through the Old Testament. A lot of sacrifices, a lot of shedding of blood that went on. That brought a certain level of forgiveness. But it didn't really bring freedom. It didn't really bring freedom. I like the way Paul, Paul here talks about this, and he, he compares it to a child receiving an inheritance. If you look at, up at uh, verse 1. He says, what I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. Let's, let's say, for example, that you're 12 years old and all of a sudden your parents, are, your parents are wealthy, but they're killed in an accident. Well, most wealthy people will have a will set up for their children. And they'll have something in that will that will say something like, uh, all of my assets go into this trust. And they, 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 um, they appoint a trustee to take care of it. So as long as my children are minors, you take care of this trust and you give the children a certain allowance out of this trust. And so you're this child and you get a certain allowance out of that trust. Even though you own it all, that's what Paul's saying here, even though you own it all, you don't really get the full benefit of it until you mature, 
until you reach a certain pre-appointed time set by your parents, whether that's 18 or 21 or 30 or whatever it is, pre-appointed time set by your parents. That's exactly what he's talking about here in uh, the first couple of verses here in chapter 4. He's saying, under the old law, you were like a child. You had certain benefits of God's inheritance. You had certain benefits, but you didn't have it all. You just had a portion of it. But it wasn't until Jesus came that you got it all. That you got it all. That you got all the benefits of that. And uh, they could get forgiveness of their sins, but they were still under the bondage of a lot of rules, weren't they? A lot of ridiculous rules and regulations. They were like a child. A child that has some of those benefits, but there's still certain rules that apply, right? There's still certain things that they have to abide by. You know, like the Civil War, because of the death of 625,000 soldiers, others were set free. It's the same way for us. Because of the death of Jesus Christ, we are set free because of what he did for us. See, freedom is never free. And freedom only comes with the shedding of blood. And the third thing is, with great freedom comes great responsibility. Freedom only works when people are moral and good. Have you noticed that as society gets less moral and worse and worse, more laws are passed that limit the freedoms on the rest of us? For example, when you go through airport security, you have to take your shoes off. Why do you have to do that? Because some idiot put a bomb in his shoe. And so now all of our limit, freedoms are limited because of that. Also, when you go through airport security, they have this x-ray machine that looks at you or you get groped by a TSA agent. Why? Because some person tried to put a bomb in their underwear. <laughs> they abused their freedom. When you want to buy a gun, you have to go through a background check and wait for three days and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because some people have misused their freedom with guns. See, government's only response when people don't respect their freedom is to come up with a new law that takes that freedom away for everybody else. And sometimes they do some crazy things. They come up with some crazy laws. Here's just a few examples. Did you know that in Chicago, it is illegal to fish while sitting on a giraffe's neck? <laughs> now I'm thinking, who tried that <laughs> to come up with a law like that? It's also in Chicago. Now, mind you, in Chicago. Now, remember this if you ever tra tra travel to Chicago. It is illegal to eat in a place that's on fire. <laughs> who tried that? Also in Collinsville, Illinois. Now, I might agree with this one. It's illegal to wear sagging pants in Collinsville, Illinois. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> uh, but why was that law passed? Because people were wear, wearing sagging pants, right? And you've got to love California. You know California's got some crazy laws, right? Um... In Baldwin Park, California, mind you, and I never try this in Baldwin Park, California. I guess you can try it other places, but not in Baldwin Park, California, because in Baldwin Park, California, it is against the law to ride a bicycle in a swimming pool. <laughs> um, in Carmel, California, ice cream may not be eaten while standing on the sidewalk. Why did they pass that law? Probably because people were making a mess on the sidewalk. But thankfully, when Clint Eastwood was the mayor, he repealed that law. So now you can eat ice cream on the sidewalk. Oh, in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, it is illegal to beat your wife with a strap that's wider than two inches without her permission. So I'm picturing this, right? You know, you're like... You get your strap out and you measure it. If it's inch and three quarter, you can go ahead and beat her. If it's wider than that, you say, honey, can I beat you with this? Why are those laws even there? Because obviously somebody did it at some point, right? 
And in Dana Point, California, there's a law that says you cannot use your own restroom if the window's open. <laughs> Do they have an odor problem or what? I don't know. I don't get that. <laughs> Crazy laws. Because somebody at some point abused their, pre their freedom, right? Because with great freedom comes great responsibility. What about in the spiritual sense? 1 Peter 2.16 says, Live as free people. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Live as God's slaves. What's that mean? As a free person, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're free to make choices. But he says, don't abuse your freedom. Don't fall back into sin. See, with freedom become, comes great responsibility. If you look at, at what Paul says here in, uh, in Galatians, in verse 9, he says, But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You're going right back to doing what you were doing before? He said, don't be, go back and be enslaved by them over again. Because with great freedom comes great responsibility. With great freedom comes a great responsibility to self-govern. And we can look at that in our society as well, in our secular society. As Benjamin Franklin was leaving the Independence Hall in Philadelphia after signing the Constitution, he was asked by someone, they said, Doctor, what kind of government did you give us? His reply was, a republic, if you can keep it. Because, see, he understood with a free society comes great responsibility. And he wasn't sure if people were going to stand up to that. John Adams also said this. He said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And I fear at the core of our problems in America today is the fact that we are losing the ability to self-govern ourselves. When the moral fiber, fiber of the people erodes, the only alternative is bigger and more repressive government. I think we're seeing that in the church as well. People are not willing to call sin what it is. People are not willing to stand up and speak the truth. We have pastors who are afraid to confront sin in their church because they might lose their paycheck. You know, I'm, I'm thankful I don't have to worry about that because I don't care if I get paid or not. But there's a lot of them that that's their life. And there's pressure. And people will use that to pressure pastors to say certain things and not say certain things. When we have every mainline denomination who has now accepted homosexuals as pastors, I think the moral fibers are falling away. You know, there are those who say it isn't sin, or there are those who say, even if it is, it's all covered by the blood. It's this freedom that we have to do whatever we want. Paul says, oh no, oh no, don't do that. Don't get enslaved by that again. Romans 6 says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. We can no longer live in it. Turn with me to the book of Revelations. In Revelations chapters, the first couple chapters, Jesus was talking to John before he, just as he was beginning to give him the revelation of the end times, things that were going to happen in the future. And he starts out with talking to the churches. And he has seven different churches that he talks about. These were all churches that actually existed in that day. But it was also different types of churches. And I believe we have all these different types of churches that exist today. And I just want to talk about one of those churches. And it was the church at Pergamon. And if we look at uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, he says, To the angel of the church in Pergamon write, 
These are the words to him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you may remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Now, two things that I want to focus on here that God has against this church at Pergamon. And I want to underline this in verse 14. The teachings of Balaam is the first one. The teachings of Balaam. What are the teachings of Balaam? If you remember the story of Balaam, the, the uh, Balak sent messengers to him and gave him all kinds of gifts and stuff. And said, hey, come, come and um, curse the Israelites for me. And Balak said, Balaam said, no, no, I can't do that. And so, so Balak, Balak sent more gifts. And finally Balaam says, all right, I'll do it. And it took a talking donkey to get his attention. And... Uh, but he went anyway. But God told him to only say what he would say. But here's the point. Balaam was willing to do, to go against what God said for money. For financial gain for himself. He was willing to do that. And in this, in this passage of scripture, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm against those who do that. Who are willing to do whatever it takes just for money. That's the first one. He was willing to compromise his principles for money. The second one says the teaching of the Nicolaitans there in verse 5, or verse 15. The teach, what's the teaching of the Nicolaitans? Well, it was a, in that time there was this fellow named Nicholas. And this was a, the sect in this early church that followed Nicholas. It was kind of like a denomination, I guess. And they followed this guy, so they named people after him, the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans basically believed that you had a license to do anything you wanted to do. Whatever feels good, do it. Because we have freedom, right, in Jesus Christ. We have this total freedom in Jesus Christ. So if you wanted to commit adultery, hey, it's no problem. You know, there's forgiveness. You want to live with your girlfriend? Hey, no problem. We have this forgiveness. Whatever you want to do, you know, that's fine. That was the Nicolaitans. Sounds kind of familiar, don't it? Sounds kind of familiar. But notice what Jesus said he will do in verse 16. He says, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. What's the sword of Jesus' mouth? The word of God, right? It's the Word of God. I'll fight against them with the Word of God. The Word of God is the judge and the jury. We're not. The Word of God is the judge and the jury. But he also has more to say. He tells them to repent. And then he says, he that overcomes, in verse 17, says he'll do some things. He says, I will give him the hidden manna. I'll give him the hidden manna. What's that? Remember when the children of Israel were in the wilderness? God gave them manna, right? God gave them everything they needed in the wilderness. The, that manna had all the nutrition that they needed. In the spiritual sense, Jesus is saying, you overcome this, I'm going to give you everything you need spiritually. I'm going to be sufficient for you. You're going to get everything that you need. He also says, I will give him a white stone. Now, what's that mean? A white stone. You know, in ancient, ancient days, if a person was on trial, when the verdict came down, the jury would come out, and they would have two stones. They had a white stone and a black stone. If the person was found guilty, they would give them the black stone. If they were found innocent, they would give them the white stone. 
Jesus is saying, you overcome, I'll give you a white stone. You'll be innocent. You'll be free. You'll be free. He also says, a white stone with a new name. A new name. He's going to give you a new name. Now think about this a little bit. How many times in the Bible when someone went through a great transition in their life, God gave them a new name? Think about Abram. When Abram made the covenant with God, or God made the covenant with Abram, he said, you're not going, you're not going to be called Abram anymore. You're Abraham from this point on. We think about Jacob. When Jacob wrestled with an angel all night long and said, angel, would you bless me? The next morning, the angel told him, you're not Jacob anymore, you're Israel. You're Israel. How about Simon? Simon, after he met Jesus, he met the Messiah. He's called Peter. And probably the most dramatic one was Saul. After he had that experience on the Damascus Road. And he was walking one way and he made the shift and started walking the other way. In the opposite direction following Jesus, his name was no longer Saul. It was Paul. You know, when you overcome, Jesus says, I'll give you a new name. Now, maybe nobody else knows what that name is. Maybe you don't even know what that name is. But when God looks at you, he sees a new name. He sees a new person. He sees a person that's free. He sees a person that's not in slavery anymore. He's free. You're free. So after you overcome, God sees a new person, gives you a new name. Okay, let's go to number four, the last one. Number four is the choice. We have a choice this morning. A slave to God or a slave to Satan. Turn with me to Romans chapter 16. Or Romans chapter 6, I'm sorry. Romans chapter 6 in verse 16. <clears throat> Again, another passage of scripture about slavery. Verse 16 says, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now... Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Even though, even though we have total freedom, we have total freedom from the consequences of our sins, there are still some universal laws that exist that we have that constrain us. For example, several years ago when we were on vacation, Gary and I saw this sign that said, Go skydiving! We're like, hey, we've never done that. Come on, let's go. So we uh, went to this place and paid our money and... and uh, they had this little bitty airplane. Well, they, they take you in, they, they give you this crash course in skydiving, right? And uh, tell us what to do and everything and, and how to do it. And it was a buddy skydiving. We had the expert that would be strapped to our back, and we'd go up and go skydiving. Now, they could only take one of us at a time because the plane was just a little puddle jumper. It was about from, from here to that first bench. It was a little bitty thing. And... Uh, so Gary went first, and that was really neat to see Gary, a little bitty speck up in the sky, come flying down, and I was able to watch him. That was my turn, right? So they put me in this plane, and we go 
10,000 feet. We're circling, going up 10,000 feet. We're in the Bahamas, right? And so from 10,000 feet, you can see the whole island. You know, it's not very big from up there. And way down there, there's this, it's, the island's covered with trees, by the way. And there's this little patch of sand that looks about this big that you're supposed to land on, you know. And uh, so we get strapped on and... and uh, the guy opens the door and he says, okay, stop. Now, now I'm thinking by this time, you know, I'm not sure this is a good idea. <laughs> and he says, now put your foot out on that little platform out there and on the wing there's a little brace and a little place to put your foot and I start putting my foot out there. I never got it there. He pushed me out. <laughs> what freedom! I mean, flying. It was amazing. Falling for, I don't know, probably 7,000 feet. Just free falling freedom. Now what if a skydiver would decide I want total freedom today. I'm not going to strap a parachute on today. Now, there's still certain laws that apply. You don't strap a parachute on. You're going to have freedom until you hit that cert- sudden stop at the bottom, right? And it's kind of that way in our Christian life too. Yeah, we have a lot of freedom. We have a lot of freedom. But with that comes a lot of responsibility. With that comes a lot of responsibility that there's certain laws that God has in, in place. It says you abide by these laws, you stay in this perimeter, you're going to have a wonderful life. You're going to have a blessed life. You get outside of those laws, uh, you're going to have some problems. You're going to have some problems. So on this Memorial Day weekend, let's not forget... Let's not forget that freedom is never free. Somebody paid the price for our American freedom and also for our spiritual freedom. Jesus Christ paid the price for that. And freedom only comes with the shedding of blood. Jesus shed his blood to set us free. And also with great freedom comes great responsibility. Don't abuse it. And you have a choice. You can either be a slave to sin... Or slave to God. I choose God. How about you? You choose God this morning? All right, give me some praise this morning. All right. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you that we can go free. That you look at our lives and you see that they're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That you see a new name. A new name. Not the old name that lived under sin and all that stuff. But a new name that is free. Your word says there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for that, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this country that we live in where we can be free. And we praise and honor you for that this morning. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.